Welcome to Ida History, the show that digs up the most thought-provoking stories from Idaho's history. Here are your hosts, Jeff Wade and Mark Iverson. That's right, this is Ida History, and I am one of your hosts, Jeff Wade, sitting here with my partner, Mr. Your Mark boom. Iverson. Oh, your boon companion. What does that mean? I don't know, it's what British people say, I think. Okay. You're my mate. You're my chum. <laughs> so, yes, right. We've got a great topic for you tonight, but really quick, I want to thank our sponsors, as well as the band called Devil's County for our music. Uh, check them out on Spotify or wherever you get your music. With that, Mark, why don't we get into uh, our episode topic tonight? Actually, why don't you give us that quick synopsis of what we're going to be talking about tonight, Mark? So the Snake War is what we'll be talking about, and it was uh, one of several, quote, end quote, Indian wars fought out here in the West. You know, you had Idaho had, you know, several of these conflicts, wars, including the Bannock War, and kind of a continuance of those series of conflicts was the Sheep Eater War. I'm not familiar too much with the CDA War. The Coeur d'Alene War. The Coeur d'Alene War. Yeah. 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 It was... Uh... Like 1850s, it was part of the Yakima War, so you don't really hear about it too much on this side. I had heard about the Yakima War in the 1850s, and then probably the most famous war that uh, occurred in the Pacific Northwest was the Nez Pierce War, a particularly tragic uh, conflict. And then uh, the Snake War resulted in the deaths of approximately 1,782 people. Um, And when I say people... I mean Native Americans, settlers, and soldiers. That's right. So that figure of 17 or 1,782 means that it was probably the deadliest Indian War in the entire West, which is weird because we don't talk about it a lot. No, no, we don't. So, Mark, did I tell you that this is actually the reason I got into local history? Probably, but I forgot. (laughs) So... um, (laughs) What happened was my friend Ben and I were talking one night. We were watching this weird uh, DVD that the Mountain Home Chamber of Commerce put out. It was like this psychic guy. And he's like walking around to these different buildings in Mountain Home, like giving these psychic readings about what happened there and all the ghosts and stuff. Terribly produced, but it was was interesting. It'll be a classic someday somewhere. Yeah. So (laughs) we went... The next, we, you know, we were watching that. And then we went uh, to the museum down in Mount Home the next day. And Ben was actually telling me about the Snake War and never heard of it before. And he's telling the lady at the museum about it and whatnot. A couple weeks later, we decided to uh, start a podcast, and that was Cascadia, History of the Pacific Northwest. And the Snake War was actually our very first episode of that show. Snap. I don't you know, should listen to that. You should. I mean, the audio is terrible in the first couple of them but it was a starting point at least so yeah mark uh the deadliest indian war in the west also one of the least talk about one of the least talked about and we're going to talk more about why that is at the end of uh this series of episodes on the snake war but i wanted to kind of compare something really quick mark you mentioned that the nez Perce war was probably the well most well known uh but there were About 300 less deaths in the Nez Perce War than there was in the Snake War. Wow. The number of casualties in the Snake War is most comparable to the French and Indian War, which was way back in the the 1750s and 60s, uh, back when old George Washington was just an officer in the British Army. Yeah, he had some frightful experiences out there near, what, Pittsburgh? Right. Yeah. Yeah, And, I mean, the causes of that war and stuff were not really comparable, but the number of casualties were sure well let's talk about sources for this episode let's do that yes there's really only one book on the snake war um, and it is the deadliest indian war in the west the snake conflict 1864 to 1868 by gregory mishno 
other than that, we have found, you know, the army records here or there. But most of the information is going to come from, like, newspapers um, from that time and place, especially the Idaho Statesman, the Idaho World, uh, the Owyhee Avalanche. That's a good one. Out of Silver City, right? Yeah. And uh, also uh, a great article in the Pacific Northwest Quarterly called Caleb Lyons' Indian Policy, which was written by the miggity mac daddy of all idaho history merle wells oh yeah what a guy fantastic fella i never knew him i think he died before i was born yeah but you know you can count on him still you sure can actually the uh what's it called the reading room or the at the state archives oh where the mccain cl- oh no the state art that's right isn't it yeah it's named after him Oh, okay. <laughs> Pretty. I thought it was like the Lincoln Room, you know, because everything. Everything will revolves around Lincoln there. The old top hat himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, also, um, there's a book called Hawaii Trails by Mike Hanley and Ellis Lucia that I just found a few days ago that I've been flipping through. And, uh, yeah, so that's pretty much uh, the sources on the Snake War. Like, there's not a lot out there for some reason well let me ask you something jeff you can ask me anything oh well i treasure that (laughs) but since we're talking about sources real quick let's talk about the lack of perspective um and you know information from native american tribes from the Cayuse, not the Cayuse, but (laughs) the paiute the uh, bannock and the shoshone right you probably know more about this than I do, but why are there not ready sources about? That's a, actually thank you for bringing this up because I was I was going to put that in here, but I forgot. But uh, yeah, it was obviously before a lot of these tribes actually learned how to how do I put this? How to written language, um, so they didn't, weren't writing at the time, so that makes it difficult. Also, a lot of the information we do know from the native perspective are things that were passed down generationally. So those things get changed over time. Um, you know, they're not often written down by predecessors of those generations that actually lived it. Um, the other thing is like, there's no like one place for these. So I've actually, I've found a few things lately. A lot of them are in kind of these disparate archives spread out throughout the Pacific Northwest. Some of them are online. Some of them we'd have to go to in person, like down in Nevada, Oregon, all over. Uh, yeah, so like you said, it's very difficult to get your hands on the uh, Native perspective. And I've included a little bit in here. And as we find more, Mark, I'm, I'm going to gather those together and hopefully do a follow-up to this episode later on with more of that Native perspective in it. Well, that sounds good to me. Yeah, so Mark, it's a lot of inf- a lot of work pulling all this information together. Usually, I can write a podcast script in you know a couple of days. This took me like four or five weeks, right? So there's a lot of reporting in the newspapers about what we'll, we're going to refer to as Indian depredations. Mark, do you know what that would refer to? Depredations caused by Indians. Yeah, or as we say today, Native Americans. Exactly. Okay. Um, probably violent actions on the part of. Uh, one of the number of tribes in the quote-unquote snake Indian group. So yeah, uh, we're talking about like thefts of livestock, uh, raids on cattle ranches, um, attacks on supply trains or wagon trains, things like that. Those are all what we're going to refer to as a depredation. Okay. White people depredated as well, so we're not discriminating there. White people depredated all the time, all over the West. They sure did. <laughs> I still depredate. I bet you do. (laughs) Not to mention the conflict covers such a large geographical area, including much of southern Idaho, eastern Oregon, northern California, northern Nevada. Uh, We're trying to focus this episode, though, on Idaho as much as possible. But of course, there are other important events that happened outside of the state, especially toward the end. We'll talk about... um, also, like I said, this is going to be probably at least a two-part episode, if not a three-part episode. We'll see where we're at. But we're not even going to get to everything in that you know time span. We just want to we just want to give everyone a good understanding of what the Snake War was and what it was about, and uh, 
what kind of the aftermath was. So with that, Mark, why don't we talk about how this whole thing got started? Well, alrighty then. Um, so it started when basically white people started stealing Native American land and resources, to put it bluntly. Uh, but to be more academic about it, it started with the fur trade. You know, so this is a dead horse we'll probably have to beat uh, in several episodes, but uh, here we go. Anyway, I want all of our listeners to visualize with me. Animals create their own trails from which to seek food, water, and shelter. Native Americans learned how to utilize those trails uh, for hunting or wild hunting. And when the fur trappers came through, they learned these trails to ply their trade. And while working and living in peace with the natives, mostly, you know, mostly. Uh, and so then the trappers... Uh, sent that knowledge back east, uh, you know, when they returned or sent their letters or diaries back. And before you know it, the Oregon Trail springs up, right? And uh, early on, natives would act as guides, uh, and there was a lot of trading uh, going on, like in the Boise Valley. Uh, you know, a lot of times you read in these journals, they come up over the rise where uh, um, Point. Bonneville Point is, thank you. And uh, they see all the fire, fires below, and they traded uh, fish, right? So the salmon that they were catching in the Boise um, and other fish for uh, European goods, which eventually they brought with them on the trail to be able to trade for, from what I understand. And so, yeah, I mean, things were pretty good for a while there in the 1840s. You know so much more about that time period than I do, so appreciate you adding that in. I was there in another life. You were? Were you French? We, oui. Because that's going to help you pronounce this name, this next part. Oh, shoot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, yeah, that's easy. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, Mark, that was uh, great and all until the California gold rush happened in 1849. Then you have thousands of people moving through native lands every summer. The immigrants often traveled with herds of livestock, which would trample and eat the vegetation. As the years wore on, the cattle would have to get further and further away from the trail to find forage. So there were attacks on wagon trains on the trail throughout southern Idaho, and some of which, which ended in massacres. Uh, but their violence really escalated when gold was found in Idaho, bringing about more permanent settlements in mass. Well, these white southerners found themselves living in the territory of what they called the Snake Indians. But they were mostly, you know, most accurately called the Shoshone, the Bannock, and the Northern Paiutes. The term Snake Indian goes all the way back to the year 1739, when French trader, and this is easy for me to say, of course, <laughs> Pierre Gautier, Gautier, <laughs> I can't, okay, De Varennes, Sieur de la Verendrie. Jeez, that's... Imagine writing that on your, uh, your tax forms every year. Oh my goodness, that is a mouthful. <laughs> I think I've seen him referred to as Pierre Gautier, so I think that's... Oh, hey, I've heard of this guy. Yeah. Okay, Pierre Gautier. Okay, but, uh, so that's, uh, let's see the... But he was the first to use the, the term, the Snake Indians. Oh, uh, okay, uh, yeah, so when he was describing the Shoshone. Okay, so when Lewis and Clark expedition uh, encountered the Shoshone people... You know, they were living among the crow, and he was told that they were uh, Sosones, or Snake Indians. Um, other Plains tribes also referred to the Shoshone as the snakes, probably because, you know, they used a hand sign to refer themselves uh, to themselves, basically a, resembled a snake crawling. There was also a misconception that they were called snakes because they ate snakes as a primary food source. Yeah, I've never heard that, but gross. Um, I guess don't knock it till you try it. I never want to try that. But uh, basically, they were called the digger Indians, uh, meaning that they did uh, dig into the dirt for food. But they were after the kamas bulbs uh, and other plants. And I, I actually read that kamas bulbs uh, from what the plant that grows in the plains right in mm -hmm. idaho mm -hmm. uh it's kind of like an onion almost like the camas prairie 
That's the one, pal. I think actually we have two of those in Idaho. We do? Mm -hmm. That confuses me. Right. (laughs) Which way? Um, But uh, there's also uh, an Idaho State Historical Society reference series, number 38 to be exact, which is that uh, they were called the snakes because they would put their heads or put the heads of snakes on sticks when attacking their enemies for intimidation. That would scare the crap out of me. They should keep them alive and chuck them at their enemies. That would also scare the crap out of me. Yeah, yeah, that would be scary. Mark, does that jive with what you've understood of where the term snake Indian comes from? Yeah, actually, I heard I heard the... I didn't hear the part about them eating the snakes. Um, I guess if you're desperate, but all that I've read through, you know, I'm sure, like, ground chucks, you know, rabbits... Uh, Kamas bobs, larger game when they could, a lot of fish, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I haven't ever read snakes. Uh, yeah. At least maybe the northern Paiute I did, but not with the Shoshone, the Boise right. Shoshone. And like like you said, it's a kind of a, a derogatory term. Yeah, but I had heard the snake crawling along the ground thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Shoshone, uh, the northern Paiutes, they were uh, closely related to the Shoshone in terms of culture. Yet the two tribes speak separate, yet fairly similar languages. And then you have the Bannock, who were a small group of northern Paiute who intermarried with the Shoshone. So they have cultural traits in common with both of these groups, yet they speak a dialect of the northern Paiute language. I had read that, that this, for historians, especially a couple of white dudes, Mm -hmm. right? It becomes confusing because of this whole intermarriage Mm -hmm. and then... When the bands change, you know, where they are and what they're going after. So the name of their band changes, right? Right. You know, so, you know, like Fleetwood Mac had how many different bands? <laughs> it's one name. But this this is yeah. confusing, you know, because right. they just change like, oh, now they're Digger Indians. Right. And now they're Sheep Eater because they moved up into, you know, and so yeah. it can become super confusing. And then the Sheep Eater, it's even more confusing because they were even more intermarried with each other yeah you're right this is like i this is part of the reason it took me so long because i was trying to figure out those differences between these distinct groups but the similarities that they do have are why they all get kind of lumped together under the snake indian moniker and mark before we move on it's it's important to note that within these tribes there are smaller bands which are unique entities within you know they have their own leadership And as we'll see, this is part of what made the war, the Snake War, so difficult for the U.S. Army to fight. And that brings us to the third leg of the triangle uh, that was the Snake War, and that's the military response to the hostilities between settlers and natives. So every source out there says that the war started in 1864. But there were two significant armed conflicts that happened in 1863. The first was the massacre at Boy Agoy, Boy Bo. I I, I like that. I've seen that before, but maybe we should apologize right now because yeah. there are some uh, Indian names and terms in here. I, oh, that. I read this in uh, Darren Perry's work, but uh, yeah, Boy Agoy. So we're gonna mess up these. these yeah, we're gonna. Things. It's the Bear River massacre, um, which happened on January 29th, eighteen sixty three, and it was perpetrated by the U.S. Army soldiers. Were they volunteers from California? They sure were, Mark. Under General Patrick Connor, but he was a colonel then. I think so. Yeah. But he became a general because of this, right? Yeah. Okay. You'll see that kind of thing with uh, some of those other uh, people we're going to talk about. They were one rank when they were involved in the Snake War. But then a lot of times you talk about these people as the highest rank they achieved before they exited the military. Well, and then what was the whole brevet? So brevet means that it's like a field promotion. Ah, So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a temporary, yeah. Ay, 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 man. Um, um, But anyway, yeah, so uh, Patrick Connery leads this group of soldiers and, uh, you know, basically this led to the deaths of more than 250 members of the northern band of Shoshone, um, northwestern band of Shoshone. Uh, I've heard as high as 400, which I'm not sure if that's the truth, but I've also heard like as low as 220. Mm. And so, I don't know, usually this somewhere there is the truth. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and, and so basically, uh, for more of the story, you know, you should really check out Darren Perry's book, The Bear River Massacre, A Shoshone History. It's really good. Um, you know, it has a lot of his personal experience being a chairman of the tribe, yep. the Northwestern Band. And Mr. Perry is a chief. descendant of one of the chiefs that yeah. was present at the massacre. Yeah, yeah, one of the more um, peaceable chiefs. Was it? No, it wasn't Washaki, was it? No, it wasn't Washaki. It was, uh, oh, this is in the tip of my tongue kind of thing. I'll remember it by the time this is done and I'll just blurt it out. <laughs> but basically, uh, just three months after the, the massacre, uh, on March 1st, 1863, Standifer's Rangers, Jeff Standifer's Rangers, uh, left the Boise Basin for the Snake River Plain. And at Mayfield, which is still a cool old farm remnant kind of ghost town thing you can go to, um, you know, and it's now between Boise and Mountain Home, the Rangers slaughtered a camp of 60 natives. Um, And then part of the company moved down to... Uh, the Awahis and ambushed a camp, uh, this time killing 13 more. Um, while that was happening, another group of Standifer's Rangers killed 14 natives on the Malra River. And for more on that story, check out Jeff's book. Oh, baby, I just ordered my copy. <laughs> Brave as a Lion, Jeff Standifer and the Knights of the Golden Circle. Available on Amazon. I hear, I know. It's available there. Jeff, do you like him just because his name's Jeff? I do. Too? It's a Jeff. Personal connection there. Okay. That's why I call you Joffrey sometimes. <laughs> I just want to separate. <laughs> Excellent, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Excellent. <laughs> yep, that's right, Mark. Uh, so the actions of uh, Connor and Stanifer's companies, they led to a treaty being signed with some of the snake bands at Fort Bridger in Wyoming. So you have the 1863 Fort Bridger Treaty, which specified that the natives would have to allow immigrants to pass through on the trails, and those trails had to remain open and free from harassment. In return, the government acknowledged that the immigration was highly destructive to the native way of life and promised to pay the native signers of the treaty. So this is Article 5 of that um, that 1863 treaty. I'm going to read this really quick. So it says, the United States is aware of the inconvenience, I think they're understating that a little bit. Yeah, more than that, yeah. Yeah. Resulting to the Indians in consequence of the driving away and destruction of the game along the routes traveled by whites and by the formation of agriculture and mining settlements are willing to fairly compensate them for the same. Therefore, and in consideration of the preceding stipulations, the United States promise and agree to pay to the bands of the Shoshone Nation, parties hereto, annually for the term of 20 years, the sum of $10,000, in such articles as the President of the United States may deem suitable to their wants and conditions, either as hunters or herdsmen, and the said bands of the Shoshone Nation hereby acknowledge the reception of the said stipulated annuities as a full compens- as a full compensation equivalent for the loss of game and the rights and privileges hereby conceded. Uh, so I did the math and that would be approximately $2.3 million a year in today's money if they were rece- receiving that. And what? did they keep a, an account book, the, the Northwestern Shoshone? You know, I don't think they did. Oh, well... When working with the government, I find it's always good to keep your own records. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> oh, yes, it is, Mark. We kid. We kid around here. The government's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, the signers of this treaty included leaders of several bands of Eastern Shoshone, including the Washaki, Wana Pits. I'm going to screw these up. Yes, you are. Toops of Powet. And Wirango. I think you did pretty good there. Oh, thanks. Uh, the same month, uh, the Box Elder Treaty was signed by Chief Pocatello and ton, 10 other bands of the Northwestern Shoshone. Oh, you know that one, not the other ones. The pronunciation of 
Oh, geez. Uh, would you want me to just off the cuff it? Or, uh, yeah. Um, so several, uh, several other treaties were made that year, you know, instilling a sense that there would be peace on the settlements and immigrant roads throughout Idaho. But uh, during that next migration season, instead of peace, war came to the snake country, however. The government's promise of rations was too little, too late, and the natives felt that they had to keep ste- stealing livestock and provisions to survive, which I think was true for sure, right? Yeah, they had to eat, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, on the ranches, so they had to uh, commit raids on the ranches and farms, uh, and they had to commit attacks on wagon trains, uh, which continued, you know. So unlike America's entrance into the Second World War after the attack on Pearl Harbor or the invasion of Afghanistan at the start of the month following the ter- terrorist attacks on 9-11, there really was not a big event that started the Snake War. It was more like a pot that reached a slow boil, I guess, Mark, if that makes sense. If yeah, like a good, a good roux. Exactly. Making gravy? A fine gravy. Mm, yummy. Anyway, uh, the start of the actual war can be attributed to the settlers beseeching the U.S. government for protection from these attacks. But the U.S. Army, they had a problem. When the Civil War began, old Abe Lincoln, you know Abe Lincoln? Oh, I I love me some Abe Lincoln. Maybe not much as uh, David Leroy, but I do love me some Lincoln. (laughs) So President Lincoln called for the majority of the troops from the Pacific Northwest to return east to fight the states in rebellion which left only about 700 regular army soldiers and 19 officers to protect everything that is now washington oregon and idaho from native attacks and confederate conspiracies that seems rather thin it really is yeah so mark why don't we go and uh, take a quick break for some commercials and uh, we'll get paid and we'll come back and continue the story You're getting paid? What? Yes. Here we go. Hey, Jeff, do you have any murder houses with blood dripping down the walls that need sold and need sold quickly? I might add for this weekend. Fantastic. I have two ladies that are just right for the job. Uh, Melissa Call, my friend and fellow Washingtonian, and Kara Harwick, uh, Eagleite uh, from Eagle, Idaho. They've teamed up, and they're a member of Birch Leaf Real Estate uh, out of Eagle, Idaho. And these ladies can... They can sell your your home quick, whether uh, somebody's been murdered there or not. To learn more, go to www.birchleafgroup.com or reach Melissa or Kara at 208-254-0490. Jeff, I'm not sure you're aware, but uh, we're in the history business. Oh, yeah? Uh, The Ida history business. And we go to lots of historic sites, and uh, we always talk about how best to preserve them. You got any ideas? You know, one way is 3D scanning, and there's a great company based right here in Boise, Idaho, called Datum Tech Solutions. Do tell. Datum Tech Solutions can sell and rent survey equipment and construction technology such as total stations, GPS location tools, drones, and 3D scanners. They also train people how to use them. And Mark, these services are used by general contractors, mechanical and plumbing companies, architects, engineers, public safety organizations, and historical societies. So if you want to know more about Datum Tech Solutions, visit at their website at datumtechsolutions.com. Hey, Mark, I'm trying to find a book. Do you know any bookstores in this area? I do, Jeff. Right in downtown Meridian, a soon-to-be-a-brick-and-mortar store coming in 2023. It's called Pearl House Collective, and it's a woman-owned, independent bookstore featuring big stories from the small presses. We can appreciate that. Sounds great. And, you know... Pearl House connects you with dynamic, enriching texts that you'll want to share with your family and friends. And Pearl House hosts the Band Book Club of Boise, where community members read recently challenged and banned books and discuss them nicely. So join the community online at Pearl House Collective and at Boise Band Book Club. All right, 
Um, we are back from our little commercial break. Hopefully everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, Mark, did you enjoy our break? You know what? I had a great time. Excellent. So, Mark, uh, we're talking about the lead up to uh, hostilities in the Snake War. Uh, why don't you tell us what happened in April of 1861? Well, so, in said April of 1861... This is three days after the Civil War began. Hey, Blinken. <laughs> put out a call for 75,000 volunteers to join up. Leaving it up to the states to help recruit these men. Um, but out in Oregon, that call was completely ignored uh, by Governor John Whitaker. Or is that Whitaker? I think it's Whitaker. Wiseacre. Wiseasser. <laughs> Uh, but basically, he was one of the Southern Democrats out west, and so he didn't feel like it was in his best interest to send Oregonians to defend the Union. Um, you know, so instead he prattled on about whether Oregon troops should be used to defend the state. Territory, right? The state. 18... Uh, oh, man, 18, that's right. 59? Shoot, I'm from Washington, buddy. One thing we like to do is shoot some buckshot at them ducks, pal. <laughs> yeah, but uh, 18 what? Uh, 1859, I think, is when it became a state. Okay. Or was it 49? No, 59. How did it been 59? I don't think it would have been 49. Right, because that's when gold was found in California. So no. See, senor. See, we know all this stuff. It's yeah. Just, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So in September... Uh, 1861, Colonel George Wright, commander of the Department of Oregon, well, he sent a requisition for cavalry, uh, a cavalry company from to Whitaker, right? And the governor put out a call for 88 men. Whopping 88 <laughs> men? Shoot, man, that's way... I thought... I didn't even think there was that many people in that state, right? You gotta start somewhere. Time. Yeah, but only, uh, you know... Only about 12 signed up before sending the bill to the federal government for, or, you know, a bill to the federal government for $1,985 in expenses. Um, Pretty much they were extorting yeah. the government for those costs. You know, they're in Oregon. Okay. Yeah. The government was over on the others. You know, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Tiring of the governor's shenanigans, Colonel Wright found loyal union men to recruit their own men for the cause. By the spring of 1862, there were six companies of the 1st Oregon Cavalry ready for action. You know, that kind of shows how much the governor really wasn't trying if, uh, if old Colonel Wright was able to get whole six companies together. Yeah, I mean, I would say he gets a C minus, maybe? <laughs> what do you D plus, C minus? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, something. Uh, anyway, that May, companies A through F were sent to Fort Walla Walla where they would be ordered to protect the Nez Perce and the Salmon River mining districts in what would soon become Idaho Territory. Company F would then be ordered to Fort Lapway, where it would spend the remainder of its service. Many of these men signed up under the promise that they would be sent east to fight the Southern Rebellion, but they were dismayed when they learned that they were to stay in the west to patrol wagon roads and settlements of Oregon, Idaho, and Nevada. At one point, the non-commissioned officers got together and wrote a letter to President Lincoln asking for him to call them east. His reply was not what they expected, but they were satisfied with his answer. He said that their duty was to, quote, guard the state against foes both savage and traitorous from without and from open treason within. And I like Mark, I like this quote because not only emphasized that their duty was to protect against hostile natives, but also from secessionist conspiracies. Secession. But you know yes. my favorite topic. You know what? Actually, this is just an obscure side point, but up on the Strait of Juan de Fuca, right? Oh, yeah. Up in my home area, yep. you know? Uh, you also had the Brits. Oh, yeah. Right? You know, which is weird because they like, uh, you know, on the high seas, they banned what like 1830s 18 they banned the slave trade on the open oceans mm -hmm. which they had the biggest badass navy there was actually that happened all the way back in 1800 18 dickety zero zero <laughs> yes oh there was a movie i watched about it called like amazing grace oh it was good 
because British people acted in it. They're good actors. Sure. Yeah. Benedict Cumberbatch was in it. <laughs> Joffrey. Yes. Kidding. Sorry, Joffrey. Um, but anyway, I digress. Wait, so I wonder if... Don't digress, yeah, because I want... Let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, you had the threat from not only natives, the secessionists, but also the British actually had plans to start taking over parts of the Pacific Northwest while the American Civil War was going on. Yeah, I mean, the third... The third... Uh, well, the Pickett, mm-hmm. right? General, General George Pickett. George Pickett. Famous Pickett's charge at Gettysburg. Uh, but he was out there on Pig Island, right? And you almost had the start of the Third War mm-hmm. with uh, the British over a, a pig, but it was more over, you know, land and who controlled what was right and what was wrong on that land. But yeah, so I'm I'm wondering, you know, I have no answer to this, but I'm wondering how much of these uh, threats were also that the British were thinking about perhaps siding with the southern states, uh, the Confederate states during this time period. Mark, did we talk about the uh, fact that there was a British spy named Kennedy who came up from Texas during the war and went to Vancouver, British Columbia with paperwork to give to the British to get a ship to use as a commerce trader on the West Coast? Uh, no. Yeah. That's so that actually super happened. interesting, though. And on his return trip, so on his trip on the way out west, he was escorted by a guy named Cole Younger, who was part of the Younger gang, James, Jesse James. Buddy, I'm more of a fan of Cole Older. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, bad. That's bad. Sorry. Anywho. uh, So, yeah, he came out west with Cole Younger. He went back with a guy named Jess Stanford. Oh, shit. Okay, wait, I just didn't know the guy's name. But yeah, we have kind of touched upon that. Yep. But I need to read the rest of your book. Yes, you do. Because I've read the first edition up to chapter seven. But then I heard you were working on the second edition, so I stopped. That's all in there. It's all okay. interesting. All right. Get uh, get Jeff's book. Yes, please. No, he's a poor local author. I am sure I am. Yeah. Where were we? Oh, yeah. So... Basically, we're talking about how he has to protect, you know, Lincoln's asking, uh, you know, these troops that want to go back east to protect, uh, you know, the state, Oregon, and then, you know, the territories around that uh, from uh, secessionists, hostile foes of the native variety, (laughs) and the British. Yes. You know what? I like the Scottish. I like the Irish, but uh, I know they're part of the British, but at the same time. I don't know. It's like, it seems like a, why don't you just leave us the hell alone, okay? Right. It's our civil war, damn it. Exactly. Yeah, right. Anyway. Not to mention the French and Mexico at the time, but that's a whole other thing. Oh, and the Russians in Alaska. We were freaking surrounded for a long time. By oh, man. And Mexicans, kind of? No. They were too busy fighting the French. Yeah, yeah. Cinco de Mayo! Exactly. Uh, anyway, okay, let's let's go on. Let's go on. <laughs> but what really kicked off the war was the government's response to the citizens who were being raided by uh, the different tribes, the natives. Uh, so over in Oregon, several several settlers sent letters to the governor, you know, basically asking him to get military protection sent to them. And uh, so this is really the cause of the Snake War, and a lot of the other Native American wars, to be honest. White settlers moved into areas, you know, where they they don't belong, and they get attacked by natives, uh, and then beg the pardon of the of the native. No. God damn it. <laughs> beg so, pardon, please don't attack us. Yes, yes. And so the white settlers move into areas where they don't belong. They get attacked by natives, uh, and then they beg the government for help. And the government feeling an imperative to help the citizens. Uh, you know, they send uh, the army in and the fighting begins uh, in earnest. Uh, governor Gibbs of Oregon. So now we have a new governor. Yes. Okay, because before it was Whitaker. Yes. Now it's Gibbs. It's, let's see. So, uh, you know, so he sends in a request to the commander of the Department of the Pacific, General Benjamin Alvord. And Alvord is kind of an interesting fella, you know, because here he is, a general in the U.S. Army, but he was also one of the greatest mathematicians in the country at the time. He wrote several journal articles for Smithsonian 
and Harper's Weekly. You know, so. Did you know that, Mark? Yeah, he's like that guy, uh, A Beautiful Mind, played by Russell Crowe. Yeah. Yeah. So for the less. Uh... Oh, yeah, because he was kind of troubled fella in uh, A Beautiful Mind, wasn't he? Is that the one where he plays piano? Or no? I don't remember that movie. Oh, that's Shine. Mm. About David Heathcock. Okay, anyway. Anyhow. Yeah. So it was uh, old Benjamin Alvord who ordered Pickney Luganbeal to the Boise Valley to build a fort. Good old Pickney. What we now call Fort Boise, right? Oh, yeah. So the construction of Fort Boise and Camp Connor in southeast Idaho, named after that actor Connor guy we just talked about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In southeast Idaho, near Soda Springs, was a major point of contention for the natives. Why? These <laughs> Mark, these these military bases represented a yeah. These military bases represented a major shift from settlers just passing through to occupying the lands that natives had lived on for generations. So despite the military presence, attacks on small parties of miners and immigrants continued. And General Alvord began to feel it, that it was necessary to plan an expedition against the snakes the following spring. Alvord worked with a guy named Colonel Reuben F. Morey on the logistics of such an undertaking. Uh, part of Alvord's plan involved hiring guides from rival tribes to help the military find the snake camps. Settlers in the military had been doing that since the first conflicts with Native Americans began back in the 17th century. So basically using... One tribe against the other tribe. Divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's the thing. Like, um, you know, I would say I would say the chief things that we get kind of torn apart about on our posts and things that always have to do with, you know, anything having to do with Native Americans, settlement, wars, any, because people are like, oh, this side was totally wronged or that side. So if we're talking about a system of, you know, uh, land, I, I would even I conquering, trying to conquer many different peoples. Yeah, it was it was systematic on the part of the United States. But the tribes had been fighting each other for centuries. Right. I just was last night watching a documentary and it talked about Sitting Bull, the famous Sitting Bull getting in, in a fight with in front of this whole tribe and the crow on the other side. They're all watching, and he gets in a fight with the chief of the crow band or whatever, and uh, he ends up getting shot in the foot. Hmm. Famous thing that happened to him. He, he limped afterwards, even up until Little Bighorn. But uh, he shoots at the chief for the, for the crow. The crow chief falls down, and he stabs him in the heart. A pretty vicious affair, you know. And yeah. he, he takes his scalp and they right off, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the the Sioux took on the Pawnee, and then they they committed genocide against the Pawnee. So, like, you know, it wasn't clear cut, and that's the thing. Like, you know, the United States could not have as I wouldn't say easy, but have readily uh, taken over the West without the help of tribes that were opposed to one another. You know, Mark, I like to remind people that are from Seattle that the namesake of their, their city actually was a slave owner. Oh, uh, Chief Sea Elf? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Was he? Yeah. Oh, shoot. Owned, I had heard that somewhere, actually. He owned other eight native slaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Different from chattel slavery, folks, where it's, you know, you're yeah. born into it. But yes, you know, I mean, it's true. Um, but that, like you said, was common of inner fighting between tribes and you know the united states definitely took that and used that to their advantage oh yeah i mean it's 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 a human thing to conquer territory where research it wasn't like you know utopia out west i mean although you know i mean there was sort of a more holistic uh, relationship with the land that most of the tribes had but Things change as you get the horse, the gun, and, and, you know, tribes that could conquer others because the horse and the gun did. Especially the Shoshone really took yeah. that and used that to an advantage. Yeah. And uh, anyway, people, my point being is people want to simplify things that are confusing. We all do it. But I either get somebody saying, well, the natives ruthlessly slaughtered uh, Oregon Trail settlers. Yes. And reverse that. 
Yes. The difference is, in my opinion, which is right because I've learned a lot about this, <laughs> is basically the system. There was a system in place of conquering all Native peoples for America, you know. But you get yeah. into Manifest Destiny and, yes. you know, if you look at the history of the wars between the white men and the Natives, it started in New England and worked itself all the way out to right now. But, you know, the last thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, the documentary I was watching last night about the Comanche, the Cheyenne, and the Sioux, these powerful tribes, are basically, they, they said, well, we're doing what the white men are doing. Why should they only be the ones to do it, right? And they were so so. It's not like they were sitting there and all of a sudden they're like, "Oh, there are these white men," you know. They knew what was happening. Yeah, I mean, so well, and not only that, the westward expansion also caused more conflict between the natives because it was pushing native tribes out west yeah. in front of it. Good point, for sure. Anyway, sorry, tangent, but no, it's exactly where we should go with this, and I like it. I like it. I like it a lot. I want some more of it. Or maybe not. <laughs> maybe just peace. Peace on earth. Peace on earth. Um, the spring and summer uh, of 1864 saw several skirmishes between the first Oregon Cavalry under Colonel Colonel Maury, Maury and the Snakes along the John Day and the Crooked River in Oregon. But in Idaho, the Snake War began with fighting between miners and natives in the Oahe region. Southwest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, close to where we are right now. Yeah. yeah. And actually, that's probably our focus for most of this episode is the Owyhee region. Well, so we're right in the center. Miners, merchant, and livestock men had invaded the fertile valleys and streams of the Owyhee Mountains. And they established towns such as, you know, Silver City, Boonville, later renamed Dewey. And Ruby City, De La Mar was a little bit later, wasn't it? I believe so, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's right there next to Dewey, right? They're all packed in there. In They're the all area. packed to get in them canyons and hollows. Mm -hmm. But the first big fight, uh, you know, of the Snake War in Idaho uh, occurred on July 8th, 1864. Natives conducted a raid at Boonville, killing one of the residents and stealing all of the livestock in the area. But one of the ranchers who lost cattle during this attack was number 23 himself, Mr. Michael Jordan. Oh, where was Scotty Pippen? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Dude, you know, Kerr on the wing? Yep. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, come on. Oh, my God. Anyway, sorry. How many, how many championships did they win together? Shit, Five too many. Or six of them? Against the, you know, Sonics, yep. my team. Oh, man. The glove, Gary Payton, just couldn't steal enough balls. <laughs> So, we're not talking about the basketball great Michael Jordan. The, he was uh, an early pioneer to the Hawaii region. But can I throw this in there at the same time period? Uh, one of the earlier burials at Fort Boise Military Cemetery up there in uh, Boise uh, was David Bowie. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Bowie. <laughs> so, anyhow. Uh, no spiders from Mars around them, dude. 80s and 90s pop culture stars notwithstanding yeah. uh michael jordan along with about 19 other volunteers they got together to chase down the natives and the stolen livestock a few days later the volunteers found the natives on the middle fork of the owyhee a fire fart and fire <laughs> fart <laughs> <laughs> that's after you have spicy wings jeff Ooh, yeah can of beans the night before yeah boy <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> I hope you keep that. I just might. Anyway, a firefight ensued and Michael Jordan was killed with two others wounded. Jordan lent his name to Jordan Creek, where he had been the first to find gold in the Owyhees the weeks before, as well as Jordan Valley. All right, so yeah, all right, Jordan goes down for the count, but after losing their first fight badly, the volunteers beat feet back to their ranches and mines. They wrote a letter requesting help to Captain Curry, you know, he was operating the Crooked or the Crooked River in Oregon, you know, but before their plea could reach him, Colonel Morey got wind of the livestock raid, and he gathered 75 members of the Oregon Cavalry 
and the Washington Territorial Infantry, um, you know, plus a, a mountain howitzer, little, little cannon, big cannon, I don't know, a little cannon, a little cannon, but yeah. out west it was big, right? It was a big thing, yeah, I mean, right? Definitely a game changer in some of these fights. Yeah, and I mean, so it was a small portable canyon that fired a 12 pound shell, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it. And it and hit the road for the Oahis with this little cannon. Yeah, which this these mountain howitzers, obviously from the name, you can kind of derive that they're made to be towed by a horse or a, a mule over very rough terrain. So they're made for the Oahis in this fight. Cool. So the good colonel arrived in Boonville on July 21st, but it was too late to get in on the action. Six days before, 134 Owyhee civilians marched out of town, tracking a band of about 120 natives. When they caught part of them in a canyon near Juniper Mountain, they fire, fired, and sued. The natives were fortified, but the civilians charged in and killed 35 people. There were a few warriors in the group, but the rest of them were women and children. Now, rumors circulated that the volunteers... Uh, smashed native infants against trees and rock, which is kind of reminiscent of what happened or supposedly happened at the Bear River Massacre, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I feel that that's always the thing that is said mm -hmm. about massacres, right? You know, that that's what they did to children, especially because they saved bullets or, right, you know, it was just the simplest thing to do because it was so easy. Where were we? Hoping that the civilians would join his forces. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. So, hoping that the civilians would join his forces, Colonel Mori waited three days for news from the volunteers before deciding to set out on his own. The civilians, however, arrived back in Boonville the next day, but no one bothered to send Mori uh, the news of the volunteers' action. And so Maury and his troops spent a few days searching the wilderness down to Nevada, uh, to the border, and then they circled back to Boonville, played some craps, slots, you know, and then came on back. Uh, and meanwhile, the civilians, you know, they brought back quite a bit of plunder, um, you know, that they would sell off in the market. So on August 7th, Colonel Maury, and his troops passed back through town, and they headed back to Fort Boise. They had been out 28 days without making contact with any natives uh, who were looking for a fight. That's kind of a lot of how a lot of these military expeditions went, is they would go out for, you know, a month at a time and not find any natives to fight, so... Uh, fast forward to September, when the first organ did actually encounter some enemy... So Lieutenant Charles Hobart of Company A, along with two companies of Washington Infantry, left Fort Boise headed east along the Oregon Trail. Their orders were to travel all the way to Fort Hall, searching the countryside for hostile natives. This expedition took along with them 40 days rations, 100 rounds of ammo, and also that mountain howitzer. So while traveling, Lieutenant Hobart met Zacchaeus and Reuben Van Ornum, which, Mark, we know these names, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, we're going to cover them more in depth at another time, but long story short, Reuben was part of a wagon train that was attacked in 1860, and he was taken hostage until he was rescued by his uncle, Zacchaeus. I think that's how you say that. Zach, Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uncle Zach. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Uncle Zach there. Uncle Zach. Uh, and he was rescued actually shortly before the Bear River Massacre in 1863. So for almost three years, he was held captive by the natives. Um, so Lieutenant Hobart hired the Van Ornums as guides, and the group proceeded to Salmon Falls on the Snake River, which is now near the town of Hagerman. Oh. All right. I've been through there. You know, so when they arrived at Salmon Falls, Hobart, learned that the natives had been stealing cattle and running off with mules near the ferry on, uh, ferry on the Snake River. And so Hobart sent Sergeant Wood and his troops to follow the trail. Sergeant Wood ran into the thieves about 25, 25, <laughs> wow, 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 25 miles upriver uh, on the north side. The soldiers killed three warriors 
Um, one of which was a man named Ebegon, a medicine man. And the troopers were also able to capture a horse, a mule, and an ox. When Sergeant Wood reported back to Lieutenant Hobart, he decided to split his command, send Lieutenant West upriver, while Hobart took 22 men and the howitzer downriver. Lieutenant West found nothing, but Hobart located a native encampment, and during the subsequent firefight, six natives were killed and a few were wounded. Hobart's command located stock uh, and supplies that had been stolen by the natives a few days earlier, um, and Hobart determined that this encampment, encampment was, in fact, Ebigon's band. Lieutenant Hobart continued down the river, which would be roughly in a westward direction, he fought two more skirmishes, killing one native, and on September 14th, Hobart and his men made it to Three Island Crossing. Mark, have you been to the state park there? Yes, actually, I, I bought a camper and I tested it out for the night there. Very nice. And then I returned the camper uh, a year later. Oh, okay. A Jayco. No, <laughs> no bueno. Just a, anyway. <laughs> so this is a, pl- a present day Glen's Ferry. So Hobart and his men camped there at Three Island Crossing. Uh, while they were camped, natives started firing at the camp from across the river. Oh, so, shit. Right there? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. A lot of a lot of history right there, Mark. It's all the Oregon Trail, you know, and these ferries mm-hmm. across the river. I didn't, I didn't hear about that. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yep. Um, I always like hearing, you know, stuff that happened to places where I've been, especially growing up in Mountain Home. We'd go down there quite a bit. Yeah, you know, and then there's that guy Sandusky at the old pen. Right? Stabbed his wife a bunch of times. She lived. He jumps in the river at Glen's Ferry. Oh. Floats down to some islands. Stays on there for four days. And gets away. Captured later. Shot by his son. There's a whole story going on there. Yeah. Go to the old pen. Check it out. Well, we need to cover some true crime stuff. So. Oh, for sure. Um, anyway, so yeah, they're camped there. Uh, the natives begin firing into the camp. Hobart sends patrols out to stop the... the the shooting, uh, but they couldn't keep up with the fleeing warriors. I guess they had to cross back across the river to try to get to them. Uh, but early in the morning of September 16th, Hobart ordered his men to decamp and continued 10 miles downriver where they spotted another native camp on one of the river islands. So this gave Lieutenant Hobart the opportunity to use that fancy piece of artillery that they had been towing around with him. Yeah. You know, I know I'd be just dying to be able to lob a shell somewhere. <laughs> right. Maybe not towards any human beings in my case. Yeah. Uh, but it'd be fun to shoot. It would be fun to shoot a <laughs> howitzer. Actually, Misha Brady, the archives, shot, shot a howitzer. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a man. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For the governor's coronation. <laughs> coronation. <laughs> Inauguration. Might as well be a coronation. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, so anyway, Hobart. Hobart's under river. I mean, okay, he's got his gun. Uh, but he sent uh, men down both sides of the river to trap uh, the estimated 30 to 40 natives that were on the island. And uh, as the signal to attack, Hobart fired the howitzer into the middle of the island, causing the natives to run in all directions, as having a piece of artillery lobbed in your direction would do. That's what I would do. Uh, yeah, I would run. Uh Hobart's men began to fire, killing eight of the natives, and when the shooting was done, soldiers destroyed the camp and returned to Three Island Crossing. Shortly after, Hobart Hobart, Hobart received <laughs> Hobart? Hobart? No, Hobart received orders to return to Fort Boise. So he gathered his command and went back to headquarters on October fifth. So when Lieutenant Hobart and his command returned to Fort Boise, he was he would have come across a site that was probably a little shocking. There were about 125 Shoshones, which, you know, were the enemy at the time, inside the city of Boise. And, uh, Mark, why don't you tell us what they were doing there? Well, Jeff, Lieutenant Hobart found 125 members of the Shoshone tribe camped in Fort Boise. They were there to negotiate the treaty uh, with Governor Lyon of Lionsdale, uh, Caleb Lyon. So, Mark, before you, sorry, before you go on, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we talked about this uh, a little bit, or actually quite a bit, in our Idaho Mythbreakers episode. 
I think, you know, you had one uh, thought on this, and I'm going to offer my thought, but please continue before I do that. Okay. The, the Fort Boise Treaty is one of the shortest you will ever read. Uh, you know, the substantive part being only a paragraph, and it says... First, that we release all right, title, and interest to all lands to 30 miles on each side from the center of the Boise River and to all the country drained by the tributaries of the Boise from its mouth to its source, except so much as the government of the U.S. shall deem proper and set apart as a reservation or any other location that may be set apart for our use, with the right of equally sharing the fisheries of said river with the citizens of the U.S., provided that the U.S. will make the same provision for our welfare that the U.S. have made with the most favored tribes with whom it has Indian treaties, that we agree to de also deliver all horse thieves, murderers, and viol violators of the laws of us up for trial. So, Mark, we talked in that, that Idaho Mythbreakers episode um, about the, the Boise claim, right? Mark, can you kind of remind our listeners a little bit about that and what we talked about yeah so basically the boise claim uh you know the boise shoshone uh band um basically it is that the land that we live on now in the boise valley uh and especially around the city of boise belongs to the boise shoshone and that because the treaty was never ratified uh, it was never accepted by Congress. It was never ratified by the Senate. So therefore, the Shoshone still own the land, um, which is technically true because they were never compensated for the land as other tribes were for various bureaucratic uh, fuck-ups, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the 70s. But, so, yeah, um, when we talked about the uh, Fort Bridger Treaty earlier, there was a an amount that they were compensated for that land yeah that's left out of the uh what do we call it, the fort boise treaty or the treaty of boise treaty of fort boise something like that fort boise. yeah but i mean basically when caleb lyon came up with this it was as we said listen to the episode but uh it was what was right for caleb lyon at the moment <laughs> yeah but there's no way that this would ever have been ratified by the senate or even like accepted by the congress because there had already been a ford established it was right at this intersection of the different migrant trails and trails up to the mines of the owyhees and uh, the boise basin and beyond um and you had a settlement that had started a huge important you know huge i mean hugely important supply town for these mines so there's no way that they would have ever accepted this treaty. Plus the military fort, which was federal property. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can we give that away? Yeah. Now, Mark, there's some confusion in the wording of that ter that that treaty, though. Uh, in the Mythbreakers episode, we talked about the 30 miles thing. Now, you contend that the 30 miles is basically... The 30 miles on either side of the river belongs to the Shoshone and the rest belongs to the white man. And I contend basically just the opposite, that the white people get those 30 miles on each side of the river. The so, rest is left to the natives. Yeah, so the way I read this is that we release all right, title, and interest to all lands to 30 miles on each side. So, oh, I could see how you th think that too, but... Yeah, the way I read this is, you know, so they're releasing all right and title and interest to all lands to 30 miles on each side. I see your point. Yeah. So there's some native uh, writers fairly recently that have inserted this word uh, accept into there, which I think is where you're... Conf you're, what you were 
basically going off of. I guess I could see how it could go either way. It's confusing. It's it's not clear. Which it might have been that might have been part of the issue why the Senate didn't ratify it, right? Yeah, I mean it, it, it's ambiguously, and I could see that old crafty Caleb being like, "Oh, what? What do you mean? Yeah. You know, well, like it's, just, it's, it's a typo. Treaties are, you know, convoluted to begin with, and so you but get this Caleb one is so on. like oversimple though. That's kind of the point I'm trying to make. It's just so like it's like what five sentences maybe? Yeah. Which is weird because we read the Fort Bridger Treaty and that one article, that one article that I read was longer than this entire treaty. Yeah, right. So it's kind of, it's weird, right? Yeah, yeah. for such an important piece of land to the Shoshone um, and and obviously to the, uh, to the settlers and miners. Yeah, this is super, super uh, naive of lying or intentionally uh, vague and, and. Really wish I knew what he was thinking at the time. I know, right? I wonder if he has letters uh, that have been looked into, or, or I don't know. He was kind of a scallywag. He has. Does he have a collection at the archives? I don't know. We'll have to look into that, yeah. though. I could see it being in New York, you know, where he was at Lionsdale, sure. but somewhere out there, this, a guy like this has, who's all into himself, has to have some sort of you know convoluted, highfalutin, uh, you know summary of his life and correspondence out there right. i would i would wager so the end result of this treaty though mark that it did it did in a way assuage some of the 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 violence in the boise this the area around the boise city right because these were the the specific boise shoshone that agreed to this and eventually were imprisoned in a like the camp that we talked about in the the episode right well yeah and as we talked about as the snake war was going on and you know you had collateral damage and so you had refugees if you will from this um conflict from the shoshone northern paiute bannock uh they would come to boise and go to that basically turn themselves in internment camp mm-hmm. incarceration camp that was up behind somewhere always extending northward behind Fort Boise uh, some distance, uh, they would come there. Yeah. And basically like the curfew and all that. So it, the, the population of this camp, from what I understand, went up as the Snake War continued and more desperate people, starving people, came to uh, this camp. So one of the... Uh, I didn't get into this episode, but one of the uh, Native accounts that we do have of Part of the snake war was from Sarah Winnemucca, who was the daughter of Chief Winnemucca, namesake of the town in Nevada, right? The Sarah actually writes about how she went to the fort to help um, convince the commander of the fort to let some of her people out of the fort, hmm. jail, camp, whatever we're talking about here. Um, by that time, it was the commander was General O.O. O. Howard and Howard and Sarah actually became pretty good friends and like he sent her a congratulatory note when she got married. Oh, and Howard. So <laughs> exactly. Uh, so the the long and the short of it, um, or I guess the short of it, it would be that for the time being, it, it did um, help avoid any more conflict within the Boise Valley. Is that a good summation of that, Mark? Yeah, I would say to the point that, you know, there were, there were, you know, there was a, a high number of Shoshone or snake, quote unquote, Indians that could be uh, taken to Fort Hall eventually. Mm-hmm. Right. So I mean, and speaking of that, Lyon in the, the in that treaty he specified or he talked about setting up a reservation. Uh, actually, I think the idea was up near the the forks of the Boise River, right? Yeah, there was. Well, okay, the one that I know of was uh, on the uh, other side of Table Rock um, in Boise, where the Barber area is, somewhere in that area. Okay. You know, so, and people are just like, that is insane that you think that was a good idea. That would be such a small area. It would be, but, you know, he he was, I think that was early on mm-hmm. where he was talking. I actually have an article somewhere on my computer, you know, talking about how he's like, oh, yeah, we should put him out there. Yeah. Um, and again, we mentioned that in another episode. So, yeah. 
Either way, though, like there was no reservation ever created for the Boise Shoshone, and they ended up, like you said, Mark, going to Fort Hall later on. All right, Mark, why don't we go and wrap up this episode, this first part of this episode on the Snake War, um, and we'll get going on what happened throughout 1864 to 1868 in our part two. How's that sound? It sounds terrific. Excellent. All right, well, with that, we'll see you next week. If you want to get a hold of us, send an email to info at idahistory.com. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Ida History. You can visit us on the web at idahistory.com. Ida History would like to thank our listeners, sponsors, and contributors. If you want to know how you can become a contributor, go to idahistory.com slash podcast. Please consider giving us a rating and review on your podcast app. I'm Tom Hart, and this is Devil's Candle. better than Beelzebub's Berg. That's true. Okay, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> God damn it, cut that out. Okay. Or we can just talk about it. <laughs> you have something else you want to say about it? Um, hey, Blinken! <laughs> uh, but out of a call for 75,000 volunteers to join up, leaving it up to the states to help recruit these men. Uh, oh, shit. What? Hey, Blinken. But out of a call for 75,000 volunteers to join up, and leaving it up to states. Put put out a call. Where? Uh, hey, Blinken, put out a call. Oh, okay. Not put out a call. Okay, so. Hey, Blinken, put out a call. <laughs> oh. Hey, Blinken. <laughs> yeah, so it was uh, old Benjamin Alvord who ordered... Be good. <laughs> that is just sorry. Did you knock something off? Uh, this just this computer cord here for. Uh, okay. Why do we? Does it say with an R? Colonel. Yeah, Colonel. 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 Maury. Like Colonel. Uh, what's the chicken guy? Sanders. Yeah, that guy. The Colonel. Yeah. <laughs>